Every morning I wake up with a purpose. I wake up feeling an assortment of different emotions. I feel happy, sad, ugly, handsome, weak, strong, and powerful. Sometimes I'm motivated, determined, focused, driven, and hungry. Then other days it's a process. But no matter how I'm feeling that day, those emotions get masked when it's time to handle business, when it's time to put in that work. As cliche as it sounds, there's a whole city behind me, and every day I represent the city of Flint, Michigan. I can't let my people down. My name is Eric Juwan Woodyard, and I'm the definition of a Flintstone, a product of my environment. And here is my story. My official title was a sports journalist at the Flint Journal newspaper in Flint, Michigan. But I view myself as much more than that. Yes, I tell stories for a living, but those stories inspire athletes to do better. They helped them get into college, and they also document a special moment in their life, a special moment in history. I've been fortunate enough to win journalism awards, interview pioneers, and mingle with my childhood heroes like Kobe Bryant, Allen Iverson, Shaquille O'Neal. And all of this is because of my ability to express myself through words. In a sense, that's powerful, but don't get it twisted, I'm not satisfied. I have four beautiful blood sisters. One is by my mother, and three are by my biological father. Their names are Kiera, Crystal, Kaya, and Jasmine. I also had two siblings pass away. My baby brother, Dier Whityard, died of sudden infant death syndrome, and my baby sister, DJ Nay Walker, was killed in a car accident at two years old in Detroit. I grew up on Raskop Street, and also on Avenue B in Flint's Fifth Ward. I didn't come from a family of doctors and lawyers. Most of my family wasn't fortunate enough to attend college, let alone earn a college degree. But they pushed me to break the cycle. They taught me the street smarts and I developed the book smarts on my own. My name is Eric Williard and Flint made me. A Flint family is fighting for a man they say has been wrongfully locked up for decades. Horace Peterson's relatives rallied in Lansing today. ABC 12's Gabe Gutierrez was there, and he joins us now with their story. Gabe? Angie, the family is part of a group called Fundamental Fairness First. It argues 178 state inmates are in legal limbo. To the Michigan prison system, he is inmate number 136503. To Jacqueline Peterson, he is the brother she's been missing for 36 years. I remember him very well. He was a big brother. He was a protector. Everybody said, Lord. She and her family gathered I Wednesday to fight friend. for his release. In 1973, Horace Peterson robbed a record store in Flint. During the robbery, his accomplice shot and killed the clerk. Peterson was convicted of felony first-degree murder, even though he didn't pull the trigger and a judge sentenced him to life without parole. He may have been, you know, living a, a fast life, but he was not a murderer. Seven years later, the Michigan Supreme Court reinterpreted the law, ruling prosecutors needed to prove malice for felony murder convictions. But that ruling wasn't retroactive. Peterson's family argues he and many other inmates have been locked up too long. Me and his mother is we is getting up in age. We just hope we he gets changed to get out while we are alive. Today they boarded a bus and left for Lansing. Just Just for for Michigan. Michigan. Some of these families have been fighting the legislature for more than 20 years. A House bill failed here in Lansing last year. The group is organizing an online petition drive something these relatives hope spurs lawmakers into action. Well, he left when I was three years old. That's traumatizing for a child. It's very hard. It's like a link of the family is gone. The group argues releasing these 178 inmates would save Michigan taxpayers several million dollars a year. We asked the governor's office about that, and they referred us to a Michigan Department of Corrections spokesman. He told us the department is merely carrying out the sentence imposed by the courts. Gabe Gutierrez, ABC 12 News. My, my, my inspiration, honestly, in life right now, at my age of 24 years old, is my grandfather. His name is Horace Peterson. He's been incarcerated since the 1970s for a crime that he didn't commit. Like, everybody thinks their relative is, is, uh, is innocent, in a sense. But we have proof that my grandfather didn't do nothing. In his, in his transcripts, he actually didn't even have a gun. He was with someone who went and robbed a local 
shop around here, and they went in to rob it, and his friend and ended up killing a young lady in the midst of the robbery. And they were both tried for first degree murder because it was a law that if you were with someone at the time, then you both got tried for the, for, for the crime, the same crime, which was first degree murder. So even though my grandfather didn't have a gun, he was still tried for that. And uh, it was a lot of back stuff behind it. Um, the media portrayed him as this person that, that he wasn't. And they ran a big story saying he had a gun and eventually had to reverse it and say that he didn't. So it was a lot of things that went into it. But long story short, my grandfather's been in prison since the 70s. Um, he's currently incarcerated in Jackson. And uh, he, he means so much to me. He means a lot to me. Uh, he, he pushes me from a distance. And I just want to be better because of him. And I really would like to get him out of prison one day. Some of the some of the tales that he shared with me, he was a he was a great boxer in prison. He was a middleweight champion. I got a picture of him where he's just giving this guy a body shot, a knockout punch in the seventies, and his hair is just flying around and cut up. He looking like marvelous Marvin Hagler or somebody. And he always tell me he think he could have beat Sugar Ray, and Marvin Hagler, and all that. Now that's his own opinion. I don't know about it, but they always say he was tough growing up in Flint. And uh, I've always. Uh, as far as street smarts, if, 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 as far as in the street world, if I tell somebody that's my grandfather, usually the old people know who he is, and uh, they they usually done time with him. He's like a, a legend in the prison system um, for just some of the things he he's done there. So he's my main inspiration. We write through, we write all the time. I, I try to write hand letters too. I don't try to send type copies because I just feel like it means more. And he still offers advice and he's ten times smarter than me. I have to tell him to dumb it down sometimes because he, he'd go over my head with his vocabulary sometimes. So <laughs> that's my biggest inspiration right now is my grandfather. I even plan on getting a tattoo of his face on me soon. So at this age really it's important. This is the 1980s. I mean it's right now I'm approaching everything even at 24 is life or death. Whatever happens to me, I'm building my legacy, I'm building my brand. And if I die online. Uh, because this is a crucial age. <laughs> Ebby, hi baby. <laughs> and there's Wing Ding Doodle. Ping! With the head of the century. I'm, I'm zooming in on this, y'all. Ooh, look at that head. <laughs> look at them teeth. Taking, taking after his uncle. <laughs> Hey, young lady, aren't you supposed to? I come from humble beginnings. I was born October 16, 1988, in Sacramento, California, to Anquette Whityard and Curtis Walker. My grandmother lived in Sacramento at the time and wanted to see her first grandchild born in Cali, so my mom made a decision to have me there, but we immediately moved back to Flint afterwards. My biological father didn't play a huge role in my life and still doesn't, but that turned out to be a blessing because my mom met a guy by the name of Stephen Hightower, also known as Touche, who entered my life before I could walk or talk. He raised me since I was months old, and that's the person I still refer to as my father. I don't know what life would have been without him. No diss to my biological father. We're not on bad terms, but Touche is my dad, period. <laughs> Just gonna start by saying, one of the, I know one of the hardest parts of Eric growing up is growing up with a mother like this. But we ain't gonna get on that. Please, but, no. uh, what that to say, you know, I ain't too much to say. He was, Eric was, a, you know, a good kid that grew up into a good man. You know, never had no no, no, no problems with him. He never get in no trouble too much. He was just. You know, Eric got kicked out of school one time for getting in the fight, and they hated. So they, well, actually, they only sent him home for death. That's. What I remember they thought it was like Eric hit the boy, popped the boy with a chair or something, but they hated the kids. Eric got like his teacher man was like, they wish they had a classroom room uh, full of Eric with y'all. And Longfellow was like one of the worst schools, and Eric was like one of the only kids who kept a 4.0. You know, he was a real good kid though. He was always a kid, like, used to save his little money and go to Borders and, uh, and buy books. You wouldn't, he was one of the kids you wouldn't even know was in the house. I think Eric was about, uh, must have been about three. This was Jasmine, his dog. And Eric got into the S-curl stuff. Remember back in the day when they had S-curls? 
So he went to the bathroom, nobody knew they was in there. So he took the S curl stuff and he put some in his hair and he put some in Jasmine's hair. And they both come in there, he yapping and airy hollering. So my daughter had to throw them both in the bathtub and rinse all the stuff out their hair, you know. So after that, Jasmine was all curly and everything, the dog. And Eric, you know, he already had good hair and everything, so that's one little incident that he did when he was. It was about this time too. Gave gave both of them a S curl. Um, I don't feel like there's no excuses for it anyway. Uh, I came through the Flint Community School Systems. I attended Summerfield Elementary School. I went to Longfellow Middle School. Then I transferred over to Southwestern Academy. Um, from seventh grade all the way on up. I graduated in 2006 from Flint Southwestern Academy. Um, my experience coming through the Flint Community School System was great because you're being around people from all urban environments in the city. Um, it, it, it taught you how to adapt to people. Um, some people might not be as fortunate as you, might not be able to dress as good as you, might not know how to communicate better than you, but it forces you to be able to deal with them while still having to handle your business in the classroom. And I, I enjoyed the experience um, at every stop I made. Um, summer field was fun. I can remember playing basketball there um, in elementary school and Longfellow was, was crazy. You know, I, I won all type of awards there. I, was, I can remember being a, the mayor um, honoring me as the student, student of the month one time. Woodrow Stanley was the mayor. And what was so crazy because all my friends were bad. You know, I had bad friends. Um, that got in trouble, but I would play with them after my work was done. So it was like I had my fun until my work would be done, and I don't think they understood that. Which transition to high school, I'm um, in high school, the same thing. Um, I would be silly, I had fun with my friends, but I took care of business. Um, Southwestern was, was great, I loved it. I graduated in 2006. My favorite class, my favorite teacher um, was a lady named Miss Herman. And Miss Herman was actually the person who told me I should get into writing. Um, I never considered writing. I love basketball. That was my passion. But it just wasn't working out for me. So um, when I was at Southwestern, I excelled in her class in writing. And she pushed writing on me. She told me I'm a strong writer. So I considered when I went to when I went to school, when I enrolled at Western Michigan University, um, I asked what could I do to mix sports and writing, or really specifically basketball and writing. And they told me journalism, and I took it from there. So um, Southwestern, the whole flip community school system was great and uh, I don't think there's no excuses for anybody because um, if I made it through the program I think anybody can. And things are different, budgeting is different, but I haven't been out of school 30 years. I came out seven years ago. Um, there's no excuses for the kids that they can't accept. Lady Cherie's been promising me lunch for about three years now. Okay, and two weeks ago I called and asked him what he wanted. He said I went and got it already because I was getting a headache. So don't do that. Hi, I'm Andre Reyna. I'm the editor of the Flint Journal. And Eric is one of the reporters that we have here on staff. He is a sports reporter like no other, in honesty. And he he's a person who when we hired him he was fresh out of college. Uh, he still had a lot to learn, but Eric made his way on his own, through his own work. Even when Eric came here straight from college and had a lot to learn, you could see that he had a passion for telling people's stories. And that is what has made him hugely successful. It's hard to believe that in just a couple of years, he's come from straight from college to being a leader for our staff and really for our whole community. Uh, I love that when Eric talks, he, he often doesn't even say Flint, he just says my city. That, that's how he talks about it, he says my city. There's an ownership and pride about it that means everything. And, uh, and Eric's not a part of it. Hi, I'm Twan Parkson. I just want to take a moment to tell you a little bit about my good, good friend, now friend, the former student, Mr. Eric Woodyard. I met Eric in 2002 when he interviewed for the Wade H. McCree Jr. Incentive Scholarship Program. It's a pre-college program designed to, um, it, to identify high-achieving first-generation college students. 
and then um, enroll them here in the program from 9 through 12 to help them prepare for college and then provide a full tuition and fee scholarship for up to 130 credit hours at the University of Michigan Flint. So Eric was in that application pool back when he was in eighth grade and uh, he interviewed successfully and we brought him on board for our summer program. And um, Eric did pretty well. He was always kind of a serious type of student. You know, a little jokey, but he was serious about basketball at that time. And he was serious about himself <laughs> at that time. But he was really, really serious about basketball. And, and at po some points he may have changed schools just to be really a part of the basketball team. And I think we had a couple of conversations to, to really finalize his decision in the maturing. So when he became a sophomore and junior, we began to really focus in, like, what is it that you really want to do, Eric? Because you're moving around cause for basketball, is, but is that really working for you? And I, I was just a, it was just a thought that I thought and, and that I implanted in his mind. But come senior year, Eric was like, you know what? I'm going to focus in on school, and I'm going to take the program even more serious. And he did that. I mean, he did it. And so come senior year, he was like, Ms. Parks, I know I have the scholarship here to U of M Flint, but I really want to go to Western. And so I said, okay, Eric, you know, you have to meet Western's admissions criteria, and the only thing I can do is make a phone call to see if they will allow you to receive the scholarship. Um, I don't consider myself a success story yet. I still got a lot to do, but um, I'm, I'm excited to be out here. Like, it's, it's, it's great for me because, like I said, ISP was so big for me. And um, I met a lot of lifelong friends, met, met, met Mick Sparks, who I wouldn't be nowhere uh, with, without her uh, guiding me and pushing me and still calling to check on me, making sure my hair cut at times. It's just, just the little things, you know. So um, I'm excited today. And uh, my advice just to all the kids that are out here is just to pursue your passion. Man, we down in my neck of the woods, man. They call this the Fifth Ward down here. It's Avenue B. Um, I grew up down here my whole life, man. And uh, you can see, man, this, this, this is where I grew up at, man. I come from down here from everything, from planting these fields to my, one of my grandmother's house um, to, to everything. All, all the life lessons I learned was, was built on these streets. So um, I love this area, man. I, love, I wouldn't have wanted to come from nowhere else but down here. And uh, this, this is like where I grew up. I remember um, just playing football in that field right there. Uh, we had some crazy games. We used to draw T-shirts and uh, play stick, man. It, it was fun. I wasn't even the biggest football fan, but I played in the, in the woods. And there was all type of houses right here. You can see a lot of them tore down. Um, but uh, it's the state of it. They're trying to build it back up. They they naming it some type of new little renovation, but um, hopefully it can build up and be a positive place. But, I mean, it was tough around here. I'm not going to lie. Uh, you had to be tough to grow up. If you ain't had no heart, you was going to get ran back down to your house. So. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't weep. You couldn't never be soft. That was our thing, man. I'll come down here and be soft because uh, you're going to get punked out. Somebody's going to test you. So, uh, luckily, I had all my family and friends down here. I never had to worry about those problems, but uh, that's the way it was growing up down here, like, for real. Down in the hood, you know what I'm saying, gangsters, you know, just what we do. It ain't nothing but fields around here. We in the trenches in the ghetto. Talk about E-Wood. You feel me? E-Wood, that's my baby. We grew up together to the DNA, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Trapping. I trap hard though, man. That's what I do, man. You know what I'm saying? My nigga dig it. Juice man right here. This is all he do. <laughs> Juice man. <laughs> he shooting in his big baby picture too. What's up, nigga? How you doing? That nigga Mike. That's what's up. I know that nigga right there. Look at him. That's my nigga right there. Boy, you killed it in your back picture. I do everything your girl want to do. She do everything for you. She do knees, toes, and elbows. I got you, nigga. Who this little black cutie all in my face? You better go on the stove. Y'all better tell you. You better go where they love you, man. You trying to keep me on film, nigga? What's up with that shit? Trapping ain't dead, fit for life. All right, he blew her. He know, he know, he know, he's, hey, there, eat lunch money off of him. I used to kill him. I used to kill him. I swear to God. Hey, you the world. Y'all was young. You wasn't doing nothing, man. World famous. The world famous basketball hoop I love, Avenue B hoop. Now, if you ain't had no heart, you couldn't play out here like that at all. You getting your feelings hurt. 
You just get your feelings hurt. You couldn't play out here. There you go. Oh, yeah. Many, many of our best highlights out here on this rim. Right here. This where, <laughs> this, this where we got, you get fouled, we don't call. Yeah. <laughs> you get fouled, you ain't calling. We, we don't call it. no fouls right here. <laughs> <laughs> we used to have your sweet spot. You hit the little back top of the backboard, you can hit off the glass. Just curve one right here. This curve used to be back here. Yeah, it was back here. Back here. That was the best backboard you could ever find. <laughs> best backboard. Yeah, this, this, this. This little rim, this little court, uh, put a lot of dog in me at a young age, you know, develop that grinding if it was if it was out here, and having my friends like that. Um, who, who knows the trouble we'd have been into, because this kept, this kept us out of a lot of trouble, even though it was people doing negative things, you know, might have been selling drugs or whatever. Um, this, this rim right here kept us out of trouble. You know, this was our safe haven right here, so we loved it down here. This rim. Came anyway, came anywhere in this paint. We, we ain't had no paint, but people knew where to come in at. There <laughs> wasn't no layup. What up, though? It, it wasn't no easy layups down here. You come down here, you get smacked, kicked, tripped, whatever. You're gonna get <laughs> stabbed, like you said, down here, right in this paint. <laughs> That's what, that's, he would develop his jump shot out here. <laughs> you know, he had to. Because coming in here, <laughs> all I want. With my Corey, my third Corey used to be on my head down here, too. Uh, punch me in my chest, Derek, though. You do something, punch me in my chest, I had to be, you got to be tough down here. For real. Yeah, real tough. What's going on? I don't think a lot of people would have made it out here. <laughs> that thing was just to be talking, but you know, I don't think they really made it. Like everybody else in the city of Flint, I had basketball dreams. I played with Flint affiliation as a kid, the AAU basketball team. I played in middle school, I played briefly in high school. Um, but uh, after my junior year, after a situation with that, I really had to sit down and think, rethink about life. Um, I wanted to be in the NBA, I wanted to be like my idol Kobe Bryant, I wanted to be all this, but it just wasn't working. I transferred from Southwestern to Northern as a junior, and uh, came over there, was playing on the team, and. They told me I would initially have to miss five games. That five games turned into a semester. My mother wasn't buying it. She said, you're going back to Southwestern. Academics are important. So I was, at the time, I was in a scholarship program at the U of M Flint. I sacrificed my whole senior year basketball to 100% commit myself, commit myself 110% to that program. Because if I finished that program, I had a full ride scholarship. And that's how I went to Western Michigan University on a full ride scholarship and completing that program. And that, that took sacrificing basketball. It took sac sacrificing my passion. I love basketball. I sometimes just sleep with a basketball. Play every single day. Um, so my whole, my whole dream is just put on hold. But the thing about it, I'm still involved with the game. I'm still able to play. People still know me in the community. As a, I used to play basketball in the program leagues and things like that. But uh, I transitioned it to the writing side. So I know, know the game. That, that gives me more credit because people know I played. People know I loved it. And uh, I don't think I made a bad decision. I see people my age now that are still chasing that hoop dream. You know, they're 25, 26, 27, I mean, and, and they haven't done nothing with it yet. So I never wanted to be that guy. My mother always pushed at academics over athletics. Um, and, and if I like basketball, and I just liked it. But I, picked, I made the right choice. Like my basketball dreams, I mean, I still fulfilled them. I still shook hands with Kobe Bryant. I still met Allen Iverson. I still uh, has, have a chance to be involved with the game, involved with the development of these kids' lives, watching them grow and being great. So I feel like I made the right choice with that. <laughs> so we're at the Piston game. They're playing the Lakers, and the Lakers only come once a year. The Pistons are pretty bad at this point. The Lakers are like contending for a title. And I can't remember if Kobe had a bad game or what. The Pistons may have even won that game. I don't remember. But, you know, we get to go into the locker room like 10 minutes, 15 minutes after the game. Well, we get in there. Everybody's in there except for Kobe. And Kobe's notorious for not really wanting to talk to the media, but whatever. So we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. We waited on this dude for like an hour to come out of the locker room. Or to come out, he was getting a massage or getting whatever. He was getting treatment. I can't remember. But it's like an hour later. We're all still waiting. So he comes out. Finally, he's grumpy. 
He's not in a good mood at all. He didn't want to talk to us, but he's talking to us, and, and you know, he, he's treating all of us the way Kobe treats everybody, except for Eric. He likes Eric. Well, then we get done with the interview, and you know, most of the time, he was writing for Slam Magazine at this point, so it was a little bit different, but he gets done, and Eric looks at him, he had a little flip camera, I think that's what it was anyway, he had a little flip camera and he asked, hey Kobe, can I get you to give a plug for Slam Magazine online and all that? And he just, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, man, Kobe's gonna tear this kid up. Kobe's gonna look at this kid and be like, yeah, okay buddy, where's my money, right? He's like, yeah, sure, and Kobe does it with a big old smile and he's holding the magazine up and I, he may have even said Eric's name, I can't remember, but Eric, I think he was still in college at this point too, man, and he, it was the funniest thing I ever seen, man. It must have been the best day of Eric's life. And I was rolling on it. I had my camera and I was taping him doing this. And here's Kobe giving Eric a big hug. And all. Yeah, I mean, it was Christmas morning for Eric. It was, it was hilarious. It was, I, I, I couldn't believe it, man. And to this day, we still talk about that. We shoot videos. I'm the first one to shoot video. Uh, so I'm starting some beer. My name is Eric. Eric, uh, okay. going big thing, Slim Magazine, represent all day, every day. I'm going to shake them off. Let me firmly introduce myself. I'm Clarissa Shields. I box down here at Burston. Um, I've boxed here since I was 11 years old. I met Eric Williard, I think, probably 14, 15. And ever since, he's been doing huge stories on me. He's been doing like the smallest stories on me from when I first went to the Junior Olympics to the second time I went and won to when I went to have to qualify for the Olympics. I mean, even when I was overseas in China, he was still. Uh, emailing me and everything and then when I went to the Olympics I was Skyping some time and he's really a good friend but he's a great reporter he does a great job he gets the full story he even gets your family into it and um, he does a great job he makes sure that he doesn't get any uh, any information wrong and uh, whenever I need him to do a story on me I just call him sometimes like hey you feel like um, put me in the paper like just to keep some positive things like uh, going on up in Flint so Eric Williard is a great guy and I hope that he's going far in his career it's a struggle. I'm 24 years old. I love to have fun. I want to balance my personal life uh, with my professional life, but sometimes it gets tough. I get phone calls from friends on, on random nights, Mondays, Tuesdays, and I might have to be up at work in the morning, so I have to sometimes decline. But sometimes I might, might want to get out and wind down and have a little fun. I might want to hit the strip club. I might want to hit the bar. I might want to just be a regular person. But I have to think about the decisions I make and the perception that people might have on me. But uh, it's tough. It's, it's honestly very tough. Uh, I spend a lot of my time going out downtown. Uh, I love to go to the loft. I love to have fun. Um, drink a little bit. Uh, not too much, though. <laughs> but I have a personal life, so balancing personal life, professional life in Flint is tough because I know a lot of the people here, I grew up with them. Um, and sometimes you have to turn them down. It's not working. But other times I've had fun as well, too. And um, I think that's the key to being successful, too. You have to know how to balance both of them and uh, it's a struggle I'm still learning but I'm a work in process I'm not I never said I was perfect um, I'm not a liar in life figure um, I make mistakes I do stupid things I do good things uh, but it's about learning from those mistakes and trying to continue to build my legacy of being a, a great person some of the lessons I learned honestly is that um, I can't be what anybody else wants me to be I can only be Eric where you are I can only do, do what's great for me and at first I was trying to please everybody when I got home. I wanted everybody to view me as this or view me as that and be what everybody else wanted me to be. But it's only one Eric we are. It's only one me. And at the end of the day, I have to please myself. I can't please anybody else. I mean, I love my city. I love my community. I love my family. But at the end of the day, it's about pleasing myself. And that's the main lesson that I've learned since I've been back home. It's not worrying about what nobody thinks about me. Um, people, haters going to hate. People going to say what they got to say. But at the end of the day, 
doing it my way. I'm writing things that I want it to be. Um, and I'm, I'm building my, my legacy in the way I want it to be done. So I don't want to be nobody else but me. My name is Eric Williard, and Flint made me. Hidden the million music.